give us a snapshot of your life. And the reason that that is such a good question is that all the advice that you receive from the person being interviewed is based on the context of their life experience. I grew up in a small town in England. I had one successful father who was an entrepreneur, self-made man. My mother had a personality rather like mine. And then my, the love of my life, my soulmate is my brother, who is one year, one month, two days, 12 and a half hours younger than I am. At that point in England, nobody expected very much of girls. It would never have occurred to my dad's friends in the Rotary Club that their daughters would have taken over the family business, even though they might have been better equipped than the sons. My brother was brilliant. And around 12, I thought, well, I'm definitely more artistic than academic. I'm going to be a hairstylist. And as it turned out, that was a brilliant move, not only because I had the personality and the interest, it gave me access to relationships with individuals I would never have met socially. I became a good hairstylist because I worked harder than everybody else. I, at 18, went to live on an island off France called Jersey. I went for a summer, stayed two and a half years, and then thought, where shall we go next? And I came to America at 20. And when asked why, it was because it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> I didn't know anyone, didn't have a job, had nowhere to live. I had $500. The, the two or three people I had met who had been to America said, go to San Francisco. I believed everybody. I knew America only from movies, turned up in San Francisco knowing everyone in America is rich and the streets were paved with movie stars. I have not been in the slightest bit disappointed. I was a hairstylist at the Mark Hopkins Hotel and I discovered that hairstylists in America get paid 50% commission, and to me, that was a license to steal. At age 23, I became one of the first women in the men's hairstyling industry when it was a new industry, and my boss was Jay Sebring, who was Hollywood's hairstylist, did all the movie stars hair. I would pick up the phone. It would be Steve McQueen. Hey, can Jay go racing tomorrow? At our opening party, Paul Newman, Joanne Woodward, Warren Beatty, Julie Christie came to our opening party. So again, I was rubbing elbows and shaking hands. This hand touched Paul Newman. <laughs> From there, I became San Francisco's number one men's hairstylist for many reasons, including publicity and personality and novelty. When I went into business for myself in 1975, I started traveling nationwide for a hair product company, so I started speaking. All my clients who were executives in the financial district said, oh, if you're speaking, come speak to my Rotary Club, Kiwanis Club, Lions Club. And as I had attended Dale Carnegie course, Toastmasters, from speech one, I knew how to frame my speeches and my notes were in my head. Plus, with my personality, I would ruffle the guy's hair, and very much as I do in coaching camps. Now, use my personality. And out of those first free speeches that were just to promote my business, people started saying, oh, what would you charge to say this to my group? And in 1977, I turned up at the National Speakers Association convention thinking no one's going to want to talk to me. I only talked to Rotary Clubs and hairdressers. And two situations occurred. One, I realized there is a possibility that when my lease is up at 40, I would have had 25 years behind a hairstyling chair. Perhaps this is a career I might want to develop. Secondly, I got discovered by a big time promoter who booked me to speak to 2,000 people on the same program with Dr. Robert Schuler, the minister from Garden Grove, only at the National Speakers Association and in America. Though that was the start, that launched the career, and as we say, the rest is history. 
So based on that snapshot, rather long snapshot of my life, what are your short, specific questions? Patricia, you are the lady of Lady and the Champs. Please tell us how that happened. Long before I was part of the faculty of World Champions Edge and in the partnership, I had a, I knew Darren, and he asked me to be on, uh, ask the champ call, because none of the champs were available. And then he said, would you ever be interested in being part of a seminar called Lady and the Champs? I said, I love it. So we had no vision, no idea. I wasn't part of the, the business of Edge. I just loved the title. <laughs> and the rest is history. Stuff, 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 stuff. Why is it so important we eliminate stuff from our vocabulary? As one of my friends and mentors, uh, David Palmer, he introduced me to the idea of specificity builds credibility. And in business, we all want credibility. And once I focused on how sloppy language is, I did realize he was right, and it was a way to position ourselves ahead of the crowd. In California, in Silicon Valley, many of the most intelligent, highly paid individuals, English is their second or third language. And if you speak in a way that is not specific and crisp and concise. It's very difficult to be understood. You then look at it from the other side, let's just say a housekeeping staff, who perhaps comes from a culture that would not question authority. You're giving them instructions on how to do their job. They are not going to say, I don't know what you mean. They're just going to fail. Is that a good enough start? Yeah. Patricia, you went from a hairstylist to a top speaking skills coach. How did you develop a high level of expertise? Well, thank you, Bill. If we looked at my two different professions, hairstyling and speaking, I excelled in both. However, the ingredients were exactly the same. I did not start either with great talent. But not that much talent at all. I started with an interest in, a commitment to, and a personality that was suited. Certainly, you could be an introverted hairstylist. However, chances are it's going to be a lot more easy and natural if you can be comfortable around people and initiate conversations. The same with speaking. Many of the top speakers are introverts. They have to push themselves. For me, it's not difficult. So I started with an interest in and a personality. I studied from the best. I was lucky to have great bosses and work with some great people as a hairstylist. I practiced more than anybody else. In my apprenticeship, on a Tuesday evening, people would come in, there'd be models, pay two shillings, and the apprentices would do the hair. All the other girls would do one or two. I would do five and say to my boss, can I bring models in on Monday? So you don't have to be the best. You just have to practice more. And then, and this is the defining difference, it's one aspect to develop the talents yourself. Once you start teaching somebody else what you believe you know, you have to clarify and simplify and demystify what it is you've learned. So then your question then becomes, how did you get from the beginning, from the Dale Carnegie Toastmasters? One, just as with hairstyling, I spoke more than any of my peers. In my hairstyling business, I trained all my staff to ask their clients, would you like Patricia to come speak at a staff meeting? Get 20 people together, Patricia will come give us free speech. So I spoke a lot. Then, I was the first person at the National Speakers Association who would say I work with speech coaches. And it all started after I was a Hall of Fame keynote speaker. 
I'd already earned my CPAE. And I heard about this comedy workshop from this comedy nerd, and he really was a comedy nerd, analytical. I worked with him, and, I, and one simple principle, which you know I teach today. We were working on the opening of my presentation, and one of the lines was, that day I set a new goal. No, I didn't say that. See, I don't even know how to, I set a new goal that day. And he said, no, the punch word is goal. So that day, I set a new goal. Now, what have I, we been saying for the last couple of days? What's your punch phrase? Any unit of time, that day, 1946, yesterday is a setup phrase. He introduced that idea for me at first. I took comedy writing classes with my friend John Cantu, who we became very good friends. And John was the one who really emphasized the importance of making your presentation you focused. And one of his examples he used to use was open mic, gorgeous, luscious young lady comes up and says, when I was a cheerleader, and he said, all the women are going to think, I hate you, you're gorgeous. I want to be a cheerleader, but I had fat thighs. <laughs> and he said, but if she walked up and said, have you ever, have you ever wanted the ground to open up and you, so you can sink in? Well, let me tell you about when I was a cheerleader. So you see, you find the, the human connection, you relate. So, he, and then, working with different speech coaches who had different backgrounds. And my interest in screenwriting classes, not that I have any talent or any interest or any patience to write a screenplay. However, Hollywood knows how to tell a story more effectively than anybody else. So if we can take the principles from that and then put it into speaking, As my brother Robert says, the principles in any one discipline are exactly the same as the principles in any other discipline. Friends of mine and students of my brothers who are musicians, I've interviewed them at various speaking schools. How do you put together a set? And how they would select songs and put together the show is very much how we would put together a speech. You want to start with your second best song and close with your best song. You want to play what the audience is familiar with before you introduce the songs from your new CD because they went to hear what they're familiar with. So I would say, Bill, not only working with others from different disciplines. I, I hired a choreographer. Said, do you know anything about speaking? No. Good. I want to pay you to watch me for three hours. And from your point of view, what do you see? And he said, Patricia, you do a marvelous job working the width of the stage. You don't do enough with the depth. And this isn't going to work unless you happen to be interested in the learning. So perhaps, Bill, you could say, I love being a student, and that makes you a good teacher. However, what I would challenge everyone is you need to be multifaceted with your experience. And without a doubt, without exception, A lot of my wisdom comes from having interesting conversations with fascinating people. And that started behind the hairstyling chair. If you think I had multi-millionaires, I had sales professionals that made $500,000 a year in commissions. Now you're talking about the 70s. Trial lawyers who would explain their, their, their techniques and strategies to win unprecedented awards. 
So on occasions when people have missed my introductions and say, where did you get your degree in be behavioral psychology? Where did you get your MBA in business? I say 24 years behind the hairstyling chair. Because, and this is it, it's all the quality of your questions. Patricia, you say to us that if at all possible, we should talk to our audience before we go up to speak. Why do you say that? And what types of questions do you ask them when you speak to them? This is what I call the schmooze factor. And again, this was natural. This was organic. Nobody suggested I did it. I just always did it from the very early days. When I was speaking at the Rotary Club, I wouldn't sit at the head table. I'd wander around and speak. Then now I realize why it's effective. One, you are warming up your mouth. You are getting your energy ready. If you sit at a head table and get up, it's, it's more difficult to get up and to get into delivery mode. So I really didn't want to sit and eat. I want to wander around and schmooze. Probably even more important than getting warmed up yourself is you're building rapport with your audience before you start to speak. And it is human nature that if you extend yourself to others, they're going to be more interested in you and pay attention at the beginning. Was it is you ask would depend on the situation. So if people come into a seminar room early and it's 45 minutes before it starts, I might say, you're either really tired or really anxious. You can't wait for it to get started. If you're at, at a convention, you can say you're enjoying the convention. Who's been your favorite speaker? even before they know you're the speaker. And then you might just walk over and say, how do you do? I, I have the pleasure of being your speaker. What's your interest in this subject? So, so it's just the, the questions you ask are going to be mostly about them and about the circumstance you're in. Patricia, you have an incredible expertise and an ability to be clear concise and get to the heart of the message almost immediately. What can we do to develop those habits and strengths? Would it make you feel better if I said that these were developed skills and I would like to believe that 100% of my life I am that clear and that obviously isn't true? All I can say is the longer you focus on one area of interest, the easier it becomes to do it. What I now teach and now coach, I certainly couldn't have given you the same advice 20 years ago, I could have given you advice. And when it comes to clarity and word choices, Probably you have to look at good copywriting and encourage everybody to have a script. Not so much a written script as a speak and have what you said transcribed and then look at it closely. And you have to look at it a sentence at a time. So you have to learn to understand the big picture. What is it you're trying to say? And then look small under each sentence of how you're trying to get there, knowing in what direction you're driving. Patricia, do you have a story from your experience from a speech of yours that went horribly wrong for whatever circumstance and you managed to prevail in the face of adversity? In other words, would you like to hear about all the now hysterical stories about the times that I have failed? Well, let me give you one example. And many of our amusing stories were incredibly painful at the time. And this was earlier in my speaking career. I was full time. I was doing well. I had a call from an insurance company. We'd like to book you to speak at the safety conference. So what we, who's the audience? Men who work in a gravel quarry. I said, well, do you honestly think men who work in a gravel quarry are going to want to listen to a short little blonde? 
motivational speaker. Well, we've seen you, we love you. But, uh, yeah, but you work in an insurance company because this was an insurance company paying for this banquet. Well, there is a defect in my personality. And that is when you keep offering me more money on a week that I have no speeches and it's only 35 miles from home, you begin to think, well, how bad could it be? <laughs> And I could regale you with this wonderful story. It was absolutely miserable. And note to self, if you have a blue collar audience with an open bar, even people who don't drink will when it's free. <laughs> it was the most painful experience. And that's when you need good friends. You see, you need to have friends you can call and say, oh, George, you should have seen me. They loved me. And you also need to be able to say, George, oh, God, it was awful. It was terrible. They didn't listen. Should I send the money back? And as my friend Susan Rowan said when I made that call, you were fine. They failed. You suffered. Keep the money. <laughs> However, what is the secret in life? And that is not that you don't make mistakes. The, the real, what we have to learn to do is learn from the mistakes. And at the beginning of your career, and I would not agree that stage time, stage time, stage time is always the right answer. Because there are times that you know you should not accept this, even if you want experience, and say no. Now, once you put your shingle up, and this is the money you are living on, you often make the mistake. And may I suggest, even when you need the money, if the situation is wrong, say no. Patricia, in your experience with sales executives, what attributes have you found to be the most effective and successful? With sales professionals, which I work with a lot, is one, those who realize even if they're good and they're getting results, they can get better. What absolutely appalls me is companies who sell very high priced products and services are not willing to invest any amount of money or any significant amount of money in improving them. What I would say that the mistakes are that I see, and this could be true with successful speakers or any professionals, when people are experienced, they often don't prepare for an important presentation. They think they can wing it. When it comes to the structure of sales presentations, most sales presentations follow a structure of, hi, this is who I am. I'm from the Fripp company. This is what we do. This is how long we've been in business. This is our unique methodology. These are the type of companies we do business with. We'd love to do business with you, of which nothing, you, nobody cares. You need to turn that around and based on asking good questions before you get to the point of a presentation, and you structure your presentation around the interests, the opportunities, or the challenges of your prospect. And all your stories and case histories, and perhaps the, your years of experience are tied in developing how you would suggest you, you could solve their problems. So one, Pathetic openings. Have you noticed so many people, they're introduced. They're on the agenda. Everyone knows their name. So here is, to tell us about their company, here's George. What does George do? Hi, my name's George. We know. <laughs> now, even when you have to introduce yourself, if you say something of interest to the audience about them, then you might use the phrase, in case we haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I'm George, and in my role as your sales representative, now you belong to them. You do not want to speak in a way 
that the vendors who were selling them $100 solutions would sound if you have a thousand or a ten thousand dollar or a hundred thousand or a million dollar opportunity. You want to be as different as all your competition. Patricia, what is the biggest mistake new speakers make? The biggest mistake new speakers make is to be impatient. I promise you all have the talent because Darren and I are the first to admit we did not start with great talent. What you might lack is the patience. That means you have to enjoy the process, you enjoy the learning, and you're willing to practice and rehearse. Individuals think, I'm going to go to their coaching camp and I'll be ready. No, 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 no. You go to the coaching camp, you learn ideas to go work on before you have your next experience. I was realistic. When I went to NSA and thought, I see the vision of what's possible, I realized this is a long-term goal. Whatever our goals, aspirations, or career, we need to think big, think long-term, and make decisions today that will lead to the long-term goal. Patricia, Brian Tracy is a mentor to many people. And I heard the story that when he joined NSA, he came to you for advice. What advice did you give Brian Tracy? Very similar. He's, he asked me, how long would it take to be an established in-demand speaker? I said, seven years. And I get a lot of street cred when Brian Tracy publicly says, Patricia Fripp told me this and she was right. It's rather like Nido Cobain came to America with $50. Multi, multi-millionaire, incredible man. I came to America with 500. That was my problem, $450 too much. I just wasn't hungry enough. Now, Patricia, tell us a little bit about what you do for fun. Forget speaking, what does Patricia do for fun off stage? I'm a great consumer of entertainment. I love shows and often in Las Vegas organize my trips around what do I want to see at the Smith Center Performing Arts. I love watching high action TV shows and British detective and police shows, going to the movies and reading thrillers. I'm a great museum goer. And when my pals and I go out, it's probably going to be walking around Golden Gate Park and then going to breakfast, or going to a museum, perhaps an afternoon show. And my favorite activity of all is having interesting conversations with interesting people from, with different life experiences from my own, and preferably someone who can articulate their ideas well. I'm exceptionally fortunate. I had wonderful, supportive parents, and I've had the opportunity to meet wonderfully interesting people, and I've been smart enough to ask them questions and shut up and listen. My brother says, sister, you ask people such personal questions. And I'm genuinely interested, and nobody, 24 years behind a hairstyling chair, 30 years ago to meeting, obviously they overlapped some of those, nobody has ever said to me, that's none of your damn business, because everybody loves talking about themselves. Any final thoughts that we should know or you'd like to pass on for everyone watching the streaming interview? All learning needs repetition, and reinforcement. And if you are an ambitious professional who has lofty goals, only associate with other ambitious individuals. You do not need to be with anybody who reminds you of the times you failed or who tells you, oh, come on, you know the chances of being a well-paid speaker? Be around supportive, like-minded, so you say be around fascinating people. We're glad you let us 
spend time or invest time with you. Uh, thank you very much, Patricia, for joining us and giving us some wisdom from your life. The benefits of taking my online course mean for busy professionals, you immediately start developing the skills that are going to give you a competitive edge.